Hello and welcome to episode 11 of Personable. Uh, today I am hugely honoured to be joined by Leon Zhang. Leon is a classmate of mine, a freshman at Duke University. I'm hugely honoured to have him on today. He is originally from China. He started out in his teenage years as a research assistant uh, at Columbia University, uh, becoming a writer, a project member at the Ford Foundation. Uh, he has created a startup uh, called Molten, in which he has raised $350,000 for, and he is the chief advisor as well. He is the financial advisor for a company called Uto, uh, which he helps to advise for from China. And he is also the founding partner, one of the founding partners at Juventus Capital. Uh, there was a lot to, a lot to go into today. Um, so thank you so much, Leon, for joining me. Thank you so much, Harvey, for having me. You know, it's, it's, it's a great honor to, to be on your podcast, you know, and it's a great honor to know you as a friend as well. So yeah, I'm very excited for, for the interview today or the podcast today, as we like to say, stuff. Yeah. So, as as many of of our fellow classmates at Duke, you're obviously highly accomplished. But in particular, what you've been able to tr- achieve is truly extraordinary. Um, but I'd like I'd like to first dive into for you to describe a bit about your childhood, and then how that led to your research position at, at Columbia. Yeah. So, um, I think everyone at Duke is, is very talented, and then I'm I'm actually just greatly honored to be interviewed. But um, I was. About a little bit of my childhood, I was I was born in China, and I was born in Shenzhen, China, which is one of the tech hubs of the of of, of the entire country. And then, um, um, I lived in China until I was thirteen, and then I moved to U.S. and I started to, you know, study um, in the U.S. as a high school freshman. And then um, I spent the past five years in U.S. and now I'm at Duke. And um, I have always been extremely interested in economics since I was a kid. Because, not because of the uh, more of the financial side, but because I was very interested in the economic policy making process, particularly because um, my my parents and then my family are very much involved in this particular field. And then um, I was born in a city that very much demonstrated China's extraordinary growth in the past decades. And then I basically grew up witnessing um, how the city. And along with the country, um, achieved rapid economic liberalization, and then um, achieved very high economic growth. And then um, that particular interest drove me into diving into um, the study of economics as an academic subject, and specifically political economy. And then um, I was lucky enough to be invited, and then uh, by um, at that time a very distinguished professor at Columbia University to be his disciple and then to essentially um, study theoretical work and then um, also some empirical studies um, under him. And then I've been doing that for, I did it for around four years. And then, you know, I I started off just doing a theoretical stud, but then later on, you know, obviously I started to focus more on East Asia and then I specialized in East Asian political economy. And, um, yeah, it's been, it's, it's been heck of a journey and uh, it's, it's been one of the most precious memories of my life. Yeah. Why, um, this sounds like a bit of a, a ludicrous question, but why would a, a senior professor at one of the best universities on the planet want to take a young teenager on board as his mentee? Why not choose, I don't know, a 30 year old that spent years in the field or I don't know, even a college student, why a young teenager? It was kind of like an insane story, actually. Um, you know, um, I was I was a I was a fourteen year old high school student. This guy, um, the, he he's 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 extremely distinguished. And then for me, you know, I I remember it was twenty nineteen Christmas, and then you know, one of my really one of my um, really good friends from high school actually introduced me to this guy. And then you know, we were just talking, but um, I. I, I, I was kind of invited to, 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 to see if I can participate in this, uh, project, which make me, which, which he made me write real, like literature reviews for, um, globalizing cities. I remember this topic, correct, uh, um, like <laughs> vividly. And then, um, it was, it was, it was, I was researching globalizing cities. And then, um, I wrote a, I think I wrote, I wrote 
like a lot of liter literature for, for him. And then he sent it back to me and he said, oh, this is not so good. You know, just rewrite everything, I underline. And then I opened the document, everything besides the headline was underlined. And then, you know, I, I have always been a very, you know, um, uh, I wouldn't say high achieving, but I, I always wanted to do my best. And I don't like it when someone tells me that, you know, this is not too good. And then I, I spend the next four days just working on this. You know, I don't even think I focus on schoolwork at all. I, I, was, I didn't even care about, like, I didn't even have intention. I just wanted to prove that I can do this. And then I sent it back to him. The guy talked, the guy talked to me again. The guy was like, wait, you're actually pretty talented as a high school kid. You know, maybe you can try to join my team. And that's it. Well, if you want me to, you know, so, you know, yeah. that, my, um, that, that's, that's how I joined it. And then in the beginning, of course, I was like, this guy only teaches graduate student. And then for me, I was just, I'm a high school kid. And who am I to, to be here? Uh, you know, just a lot of self, self doubt, a lot of, you know, imposter syndrome. But over the years, you know, especially like, like as soon as I started to touch on these Asian stuff, I kind of, I kind of had this unique edge that other people don't have, right? Because I grew up in China and wrote a lot of good stuff and, you know, just gradually became more and more confident. And yeah, that's, that's how it worked. Mm -hmm. Although you had this interest and this talent, um, in the economic field, in particular in, um, Asia and in China, what do you think was the, what, as a, when you were in that position, what do you think the main benefits of doing this work with the professor were, um, because there's often a, you know, for people that aren't in the academic field, there's often a viewpoint of that, you know, they're just researching things that will never be used in the real world. So what did you think was the practical use of doing something like this? And what was the output of your four years of work with the professor? Well, I would say the most important um, knowledge I gained was how you look at things in a, in a, in a more macro way, because I had a lot of macroeconomic stuff. And then, you know, in the business world, a lot of people like we analyze the business a lot of times. And then, you know, in the business where a lot of people are very successful, but then because you're particularly in this field, you don't really think about, you know, zooming out and taking a look at a bigger picture. And then that's yeah. one of the great skills I learned because, you know, I try to analyze specific phenomenons, um, you know, um, as, as something to, like, um, um, based on like, like years of data or like you try to look at things, um, through cultural, political, economic phenomena, uh, lenses. And then we tried to, you know, blend all these perspectives together and try to create like a more holistic, you know, um, review of like the, the, the entire economy. So this kind of skills, I think a lot of people in the business world lacks because you're more focused on technical stuff. And then sometimes they just forget to zoom out a little bit. And I think another good skill that I gained was, um, how to really you know, think about how, 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 how things generally work. And then what I meant by this is, you know, a lot of times in the beginning, um, when I was analyzing things and then, you know, looking at the data, you know, I just, I, I'm like a mod, I'm like a machine, you know, I'm always modeling and trying to think like, like, like these are just data as, you know, I want to get a good result. But then my professor told me, you know, you, you can't think about numbers. You got to think about num uh, people behind this number. And then, you know, like, a, a, a simple number of uh, unemployment rate might result in, um, you know, like tons of thousands of families, you know, losing, losing their, their primary income source. And then these are very serious stuff so that you really got to start to compassionate these people. And then, you know, that's what really changed the game because that gave me like a unyielding passion to like make the world a better place. And then a lot of times now that I'm doing in the business world, you know, when I'm interacting with people, looking at like, especially like when I'm trying to, when I'm in touch with new concepts and then, and in startups, even I really try to think about, um, you know, how they impact, uh, our world and then what kind of demand do they, do they, are they really responding to? And then this is one of them. Th this is also a very good tool that I have gained throughout my research years. How, because I saw that you've also uh, engaged in, in writing um, mm. for papers, um, especially in China. Now, do you think that your um, writing and your research and your knowledge has helped to solve issues or at least 
draw light them. Could you give me an example of something you, you wrote about in one of those papers and how that translated to sort of like identify problems? Yeah, so um, I think one of my unique edges was people that understand Western economics theories don't really understand China the way I did because China is a very, the Chinese political economy, like the subject itself is a very enclosed subject because not many people can really dive into elite politics in China or like um, the exact policy making process and then, you know, you know, be as, uh, t- t- to be as deep as I am is, is, is particularly hard. And then my cultural background helps me a little bit. And, and then throughout the years, you know, my ability to speak both languages also helped me a lot. And then, um, and then people that understand how Chinese politics and economics works, um, not necessarily, don't necessarily have the theoretical background that I do. And, um, a lot of things I wrote ended up being very helpful for, um, you know, the government or just uh, academia in general to 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 analyze China in a different way. It's a different perspective that you know few people has. And then um, one example would be I think when I was this was the first publication I had. I was I, I believe I was fourteen when I wrote this, and then I wrote about um, how actually my city Shenzhen as um, the financial one of the financial centers of of China. You know you need to take on a bigger role as China starts to develop. And then I indicated a potential financial issue. That is uh, the lack of financial liberalization and market liberalization. And I, I suggested that we should, we should go further. And then um, I think around six months later, actually, um, they, they suffered an issue um, that is directly caused by the lack of financial liberalization. And then actually the then uh, one of the then leaders of the city actually came to me and he was like, you know, man, I, you're actually right. You know, like, I don't know how you did it. You know, you're a 14 year old kid, but you know, you know, I, I wouldn't expect anyone to, to point out something like this. And the reason why I could do this is because I told him I have a different pr- perspective, you know, like I think in a different way, educate in a different way. And then from then on, I've been writing a lot of stuff that just, just tried to represent my views and then what people has taught me and then and these articles has generally helped the general public to understand China more and then mm, for China itself uh, you know tried to help people of China to understand how to how to you know collectively with other people in the world to you know just create a better future for all mm-hmm. you've worked you've worked as well uh, for the Ford Foundation which I'll let you go into a bit more detail on as well um, it's something I'm curious about I can understand the the US's perspective on wanting to gain more insight into China and how China works. Mm. But does China like the people and the government officials in China? Do they like the idea of the US and the wider world being able to understand them more greatly to be able to solve their issues? Or is it more of a black box that you're externally looking into China and trying to understand how they work and they're sort of like, don't look at how we work? I think absolutely. I think anyone, I think everyone in China wants to be understood, or understand, or, or, or wants to be understood. And then I think the primary reason is because the more we understand each other, especially you know, given the current situation between the U.S. and China and all that, the more we understand each other, the more we, the more, the more mutual connection we'll have, and then the more likely that we're gonna like work better together. You know, it's 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 all, and then. Given the current situation, I just feel like, you know, there's a, there's an ever growing need to understand China. You know, we are the second largest economy in the world. You know, we are obviously one of the major players in, in the global politics. And then people really need to understand China and then China wants to be understood too. You know, a lot of things yeah. do, we have a lot of great, like economic policy making experiences, you know, like we created one of them economic miracles of the 20th century and then 21st century and you know these knowledges can be used in other countries as well you know you know currently we have the Belt and Road Initiative where we're trying to help you know other developing countries and then we're really trying to you know you know um, use our experiences growing China to help other countries to grow and alleviate poverty in these places and then you know so like and in addition, the Chinese culture, you know, we are like the Chinese culture itself is extremely fascinating. And then 
a lot of American sinologists and sinologists across the world have been repeatedly, you know, pointing out that, you know, China is just a fascinating country. We have 5,000 years of history, you know, so um, we want to be understood. And, uh, and then we want to understand other people more, you know, it's, it's, it's always good to, to have better understanding of, the, uh, of, like, of China. And then it's always good for China to understand the world, the rest of the world more, because this is all about how we can work together better and then create a better future for, for the human race in general, I would argue. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of listeners, um, sort of based in the Western world and listening to Western media often get a glimpse of an outside glimpse of the current situation between the US, China and the rest of the world. Uh, but I'd like to hear a bit more of your perspective on China's perspective on the current situation with them in the US, where it's been over the past few years, the current situation and where sort of China think or you think that it should progress moving forward. You know, I have a, I've been studying US five years and then, you know, I, I, I would argue that I have a pretty good grasp on the U.S. culture and, you know, what U.S. think of China. And then um, I generally think um, there are a lot of, you know, misunderstandings between these two countries. And then I I think I think in China, you know, when I was growing up, you know, when I was a kid, you know, you know U.S., like the word U.S. in China actually translates to beautiful country. So th we call U.S. to beautiful country, and then, you know, we call England the egalitarian country, like stuff like that. So we, we think of when I was growing up, we think Western countries as great, great nations, and then we think the West, we think Western civilization as extremely fascinating. And then, um, you know, the whole, the whole idea of opening up China and exposing China to Western ideologies and the Western economy was 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 carried out by by the leaders back in nineteen eighties, and. Um, so, but as time goes on, I think, you know, there are a lot of, you know, you know, confusions between these two countries and then, you know, that are, that spurred from, you know, just general ignorance, like from people of China and people of US. And then I think there's a lot of misunderstandings, and, you know, and I think China still, you know, given like, even though we have, you know, misunderstandings and, you know, these, these like minor conflicts, China in general wants to be in touch with the rest of the world. And then being in touch with the rest of the world means that we have to, you know, be friendly and then uh, cooperate with other economies, other, you know, leaders of the world. And, you know, because we all share this responsibility of, you know, making the world a better place. And um, so I think in general, China wants to be engaged, it be engaging with the rest of the world. And China wants to, be friends with the rest of the world. And then um, we've been doing this since the 1980s and then we will keep doing, you know. What, why is this so, you mentioned these misunderstandings um, and obviously I'm, and probably with a lot of the listeners, a bit confused by what you mean by misunderstandings because sort of like relationships sort of with the UK, the EU and lots of other countries. I know China's different, but what makes China different? Why are these misunderstandings why are there not, you know, it's it kind of sounding like China wants to work with the US and the US works with China, but I don't think it's as simple as that. What are these misunderstandings? What's been going wrong? And what needs to change for these two countries to be more ha harmonic in the future? I think, um, I think in the US, a general mis mis misunderstanding is, you know, China, Chinese people are one kind of people, you know, especially like, you know, Chinese people this and that and then that's a huge misunderstanding because you know as i as my professor pointed out numbers represent phenomenons behind numbers and then you know the concept of china represents like thousands of like billions of different you know people and then we are a very diverse group of people with um thousands of years of history and then even me as a as a native chinese can't you know, fully understand like our rich history as well. You know, like it's 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 a hard thing, but you know, it's also fascinating. It, it it teaches you a lot, and then there are traditions in our country that are that are very virtuous that has been practicing for has been practiced for you know thousands of years. 
I think to understand China, you know, U.S. really, and not just U.S., just the rest of the world really needs to dive into a culture. And it's, it's really fascinating, honestly. And then, you know, um, and there's different people. We have different ethnic groups. We have, you know, different thinkings. We have, um, you know, and then these are all Chinese things that are extremely fascinating. But a lot of times people just think of China as, you know, second largest economy in the world, you know, like a, the, the, the leader yeah. of you know, stuff like that. So, you know, I would say in the past decades, China has developed itself rapidly and then this dramatic economic development kind of, um, mm, kind of attracted all the attention. And then the rich history and the rich tradition that we have that has been there for 5,000 years and then, and has potentially contributed to this economic development was neglected. But um, the truth is, you know, nothing can happen, you know, within a day, you know, say like it, it has to deal with something that like has been prepared, we've been preparing for this for, for a long time. And then, you know, there's a huge tradition and a very solid foundation for our culture, uh, for, 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 for a nation. And then these kind of stuffs really needs to get more attention. And I think that's where the general misunderstanding comes from. Thank you. I mean, truly incredible. And I'd love to have many more conversations about, about that post the podcast. Um, I think both your, uh, ability, uh, to create some state insight between the, the U S and China, uh, and what you've done, especially as a teenager working with a professor at Columbia is truly incredible. Um, but what I think will be perhaps even more interesting to many listeners is how you've managed, you know, to get into entrepreneurship. Um, you've founded a business. Uh, called Moulton, um in high school. Um, could you tell me a bit more about that, how the idea came, what it is, um, and where it's headed? Well, um, it's very interesting because I initially did not want to do business. And then I, I, I always hated it when people, you're studying economics because you want to go into the finance world because, you know, for me, I, I was more of a, I was more into academia. But um, the reason why I entered the business world was because I, I, I started to see business, you know, not as a like traditional thinking of like, oh, you're making money and you're like savvy businessman, not like, not like that. Um, I started to see business as more of a form of community service. And then I, I, I think, you know, be, doing business is one of the few ways that allows you to, you know, do whatever you want and then at the pace you want, um, with the direction that you want to go to. And then that is something that really attracted me. And then um, when I started to think about this, I, I wanted to do something that can serve the community, that is profitable for sure, but um, but can also serve the community. And then I want to do something that, um, can, that can allow me to utilize a lot of my uh, background and then to, to basically you know, I want to do something that allows me to translate some of the tools, the, my, like my toolbox that I gained from academia to the business world. And then um, me and my best friend, you know, Rithik Puli, we started um, we started this company um, as a alternative to uh, delivery services as like Uber and then Lyft. But um, the main difference was we were able to um, we're able to allow you to tell me how much you want to pay. And then, well, what I mean by that is we have a, we have a dynamic pricing system in which, you know, um, we, we you can, you can basically negotiate with the drivers about the, the, the price that you want to pay for the food to, to be delivered to your door, you know, online. And then, you know, the idea is with this system, you know, we can create more jobs for um, the local uh, community, and then we can, you know, also, you know, pay uh, the, the drivers more, and then, you know, you can also save more because um, when you guys are directly negotiating, there's no third party that's like taking advantage of you, and then it's it's a really transparent system, really. And um, later on, the system 
um, was introduced to the field of home services. You know, you know, if you need a plumber, if you, if you're like, I don't know if your, if your sink broke down, you know, you can use their system to negotiate with people in the community again to, to fix it for you. And then this has been a very, um, exciting journey because it, it is a very interesting concept that attracted a lot of people's attention. And then it is also just an awesome way to create more jobs. And then, you know, we always want more jobs, right? So, um, yeah. and, and yeah, that, that's Molten. Where, whereabouts is, um, Molten base? Um, and how did you actually go from having the idea to, to building product? Well, um, Motum, Motum is based in Washington, D.C., and we're actually doing a piloting, a pilot in Washington, D.C. right now. We partner with several hotels, I believe Marriott and then um, Shirts and all these hotels in Washington, D.C., and then we're delivering hotel foods these days. And, um, you know, yeah, and then it was it, w- it was surprisingly easy to, 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 to start a company like this because um, America has, like, extremely uh, matured uh startup culture and this is something that is i have never ever seen before you know me and rithik when we started this company you know we're like okay we got race money we got to do this and that and that we need advices from people you know um and when you go to entrepreneurship events like you can get all these you know you meet people basically and then and when you meet people they tell you their experiences you learn from them and then you you just sort of like based on their experiences design your own journey and then you know when you need to raise money, you know, you know, you talk to these guys and then, you know, maybe luckily if someone's interested, they will, they will, they will, they will pitch in some, some, you know, so it's, it's, it's really an organic system that it, tr- that when you have a truly good product and everyone can use, um, you know, you can always benefit from this system. And then, you know, there's this period of our life where we did travel around the country, you know, just to raise money and then do all that and then it was exhausting but it was it was also fascinating you know, like i personally i i i i i met some of my best business partners and then like uh, or just friends in general from these events and then from this uh, environment and then you know at duke even i i'm looking forward to meet you know similar-minded people and then you know even potentially create a, a, a culture like this or like a like a hub for people like this myself yeah did you raise this money free product or are you technical and had already built something before you presented it to people yeah so we raised this money pre product basically and then a part of and, and then a part of the was raised through these events and a part of it was 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 raised through you know just people in our community that wanted to chip in and you know obviously um you know we built this product um actually I think a very interesting thing is when we're trying to build this product, you know, Rithik and I was trying to find like, you know, people that can code or people that can manage and all this, you know, all the software and like coding stuff, which I am, I have no idea how to do these. And then, sure. um, my, my, like, you know, I, I specialize in East Asian political economy and then I, I, I analyze Asia a lot and I was like, well, we got to find somewhere with cheap labor, you know? So we actually, yeah. do. and then in India, there's this company that are willing to do this, uh, this development with extremely extremely cheap price and then you know so th- so like so building so so basically what happened was we got to ask people you know, we got built this it's a very good price you know do you want to chip in i'll give you some of our stocks you know so like stuff's like that and then there were some questionable like there were some things that we, we didn't do well you know because we're just kids maybe like signed some very terrible deals but like in the end it all worked out because you know you, you learn from your mistakes and yeah did you identify these coders before raising the money and how did you make sure they were trustworthy i mean being cheaper doesn't always mean better right yeah and then that's that, that's certainly that's certainly a risk to take but um i think in india right now especially in cities like Hyderabad, this there are tech hubs right now and then you know big companies like amazon like google i believe they all have you know they all have their you know separate like uh offices in in, in 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 these places right now and then also india is also just a, an, an incredible place to and then and it's going to have like incredible period of economic growth and they have a really mature um or they have really they have quite a developed uh, system for startups and you know, for technology and then you know 
Um, you know, obviously we have to be extra careful when we're talking to these people because we want to make sure that they're not like just guys trying to, you know, trick us. But, yeah. um, that's, that's, I guess that's just, we got to make these decisions based on your pers- uh, perspicacity, right? Like that's, that, that's how it works. And then, you know, for me, I, I've, I, I've, I've personally talked to a lot of people to eventually like decide or do we want to, who do you want to trust with our product? Because, you know, another thing that I carry on my shoulder is the responsibility to make sure that this is a good product. And then I, I, I you know, if I, if this, if I need to put my name on this product, you know, I got to make sure it's good because it's my reputation to risk. And then if I mess this up, you know, it's, it's just a disappointment to, 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 to the community. So I see this, I take this very seriously. Mm-hmm. When you say the community, who is the community? Just people, people in DC and, and the people, people around us, you know, um, actually for this product, um, the government of DC actually, you know, we've been, we recently talked to them and they're like, you know, this reduces, you know, this reduces unemployment rate, you know, this creates jobs for low income people, you know, okay. because in DC, like you can just deliver for about what and a lot of people, you know, given the current economic situation, just lost a job. And then, you know, yeah. to look for food makes perfect sense. And then, you know, this is something I'm really excited for. And the government representatives who were talking to them, they're like, you know, you know, if you want any help, we can also help you, you know. So we're also trying to see at this stage, um, how do we expand into the greater DMV area and then, you know, potentially, you know, to the country. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's in, in, even just raising the money, building the products is insane, but one thing I'm uh, very interested in, in a lot of my guests, is their ability to to build networks, and not just of people that they know, but people that are willing to help them. Um, you've mentioned the DC government, and you've also mentioned building partnerships with like the Marriott hotel chain. Mm. How did you get your foot in the door with these people, and then how were you able to sell yourself as a founder to be able to close deals with them and get them to actually work with you and take you seriously? My philosophy is, you know, I don't care who you are. I just talk to you and I'm a great guy. You know, I, I don't even necessarily want to talk to you about business sometimes, you know, and then, you know, if you want, you want to tap into, you know, my journey, sure, tag along, you know, like, um, a lot of times I, I meet people and then I, I'm just genuinely interested in what's going on. You know, what are you doing? You know, how's your family stuff like that? And then eventually we became friends and then your friends will help you and then all that. And there's actually an interesting story where I was at this event in San Francisco um, it, uh, with an organization called Thai Silicon Valley, which is a very large entrepreneurship group. And then um, they had this huge event with this speaker. And then this guy, everyone was basically, you know, trying to see if they can bond some, con- make some connections. And then the guy was just exhausted. And I was just sitting there. I was like, huh, you know, I don't. I don't know if I want to talk to this guy because he's apparently being overwhelmed by his like you know, worshippers right now. And then, yeah. um, you know, I actually met this guy later after event in the in the restroom, and then and then and then we and then we started talking to the resume. And then for me, I was just like, I don't want to know about your business at all. I know you're an incredible person, but you know, you've been talking about this all day. Tell me about your kids. How do you balance your life and work? How do you how do you how do you how do you how do you, how to deal with your wife you know like you know do you drive your kids to school you know you're so busy doing all these and then this guy just opened himself to me and told me everything he's like you know i've been struggling all this and that and yeah at that time i wasn't even trying to build connection i just, I just wanted to hear about his story and then you know i want to see how to balance my life and work in the future and then you know even just how to maybe comfort this guy and then and they became very vulnerable in front of me and he invited me to his house. And then later on, we became really good friends. And then he's still one of the uh, best advisors that I have for my business. And then he connected me to a lot of other people. So this is generally how I meet people. You know, I, I just, I just genuinely enjoy talking to people. And then I want to, I want to bring people some positive energy. And I think when you do that, you know, the community responds in a way that would make a lot of things work. How can, you've got this very unique skill. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it represents the exact name of the podcast, but being personable Mm -hmm. um, and that you're very likable and you find connecting with people uh, is a big skill of yours. Mm -hmm. Um, But for people listening, uh, you can even use me as an example or someone else Mm -hmm. that wants to create a business. They have a startup idea, but they're non-technical. 
how do they go about selling themselves to raise money like you did? Well, I think you just got to, mm, I think one important thing you got to think about is what demand are you responding to? And if you want to create a business, you know, you are essentially responding to a, 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 a like hopefully growing demand in society. And if you're, if you're supplying this demand, you know, you will find people that are interested. And then I think, um, you really need to identify your, you know, like what your product does and then what problem does this, and then, you know, to, and then once you identify this, you know, you really got to try to dive into this community or this industry and then just try to meet people, you know, try to talk to people and, you know, especially don't be afraid to talk to people because, you know, you have like my mind says, I have nothing to lose. You know, I don't care if you're CEO or founder of this and that, you know, I have nothing to lose. You know, I want to ask you, I want you to help me. If you don't help me, don't hate me. You know, <laughs> so I was like, I shot, I just talk to people and, um, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it, 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 that will be my advice, you know, just talk to people. And then I think really the startup culture, you know, aside from the technical side, it's all about people, you know, it's all about how do you build trust, build a good reputation? How do you, you know, be sincere to people, you know, really try to respond to people's needs. And then, you know, as long as you're genuinely, you, you're, this is, as long as you have a genuinely good product, everyone can use. And as long as you're a really good person, really wants to, you know, transform the community you know try to try to make some changes you will always find people that would that want to help you hmm. if, if you would have already built this business uh developed this incredible network of people mm -hmm. and we haven't even got onto your other ventures yet why bother going to university what does duke mean to you why duke specifically and what do you hope to get out of more education instead of doubling down on your startup and spending your time doing that the fun fact is I don't take, I, I basically don't take economics course, Duke, and, and you would know it, Harvey, like I basically don't really work on economic stuff, for like business stuff. I, I take random classes, you know, like this semester I'm taking evolutionary anthropology in a class about how racism, you know, works with the biology. Next semester I'm taking Jewish history and the Ottoman Empire and stuff like that. So like, I'm, I'm really trying to get a liberal arts education here and I believe getting this type of education getting this type of education you know allows you to burn your mind and then you know i don't know if you i don't know if you heard about this you know in the, in the, in the famous uh, steve jobs uh you know commencement you know speaks speak speech to the stanford graduates he, he mentioned this idea of connecting the dots and then the idea was you know you might learn a lot of stuff that you don't think is going to be helpful for you in the future but you got to believe that at some point you'll be able to use it. And then, um, I, I trust the process. I believe that everything I learned in college at some point in the future will help me to just make myself a better person to be successful in my career. And, um, and then that's one of the reasons I want to come to college. Another important reason is I want to learn from people. And I think there are much more, like, there's a lot of things to be learned in the textbook, but there are also a lot to be learned from people and then just meeting people like you meeting people like my classmates building connections you know having friends is an incredible journey you know people have different stories people have different perspectives and then they could be good they could be bad but you know i believe you can always see another version of yourself in another person and then that reflection allows you to determine which direction do you want to go for in your future in the future and then it, it, it just keeps you in check it's like a mirror, you know, people are like a mirror. It keeps you in check. And, um, it, I, I think that will be the two, two things I want to gain from college. Mm -hmm. You've spoken, um, a lot about the importance of a network and also, uh, if listeners may have picked up on the importance of advisors as well. Uh, and that leads, uh, leads to talk about your next venture, Juventus Capital. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, so I'll let you correct me. Um, but could you describe a little about, a little bit about what that is? Um, for those that are listening have never heard of it before and what that's trying to achieve. Absolutely. Um, Juventus Capital responds to the need for um, new generation of people, like people like us, kids that wants to invest more. And then generally people like us have a very high risk, to risk tolerance, have relatively new experiences, and then 
want to invest. And then, you know, we all know that a lot of people know that they want to invest as soon as possible. They don't know how to, they have no experience and they want to make money, stuff like that. So, you know, that's really what we do. And then that, that's the, that's the issue that we're trying to solve, you know, and like, and then this capital we have, you know, we, we focus on both public, public and private markets. And then we have people that are both that are very experienced in these markets to help invest. And then more importantly, this entire fund, this entire investment fund, it's, it's 100% millennial, uh, Gen Z, you know, backed and in Gen Z or millennial run. So our advisors are young people, you know, our, 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 our partners are young people, you know, our COO is a young person. It's like we were all well, just kids, but I believe in today's world, kids can make a change. And I believe in today's world, there are a lot of people like you and I are, that are passionate to make some, to, 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 to build their own career. And then this is really a platform for these people to, to meet, to talk, you know, it's, 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 it's more than just a fun. It's, it's an environment. It's a, it's a society. It's a, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like a fraternity in the sense, if you want, if you, if you want to like look at it that way, but the end goal is for people to meet good people to people for people uh, to for for like-minded business or rented you know college students to really connect to each other and then you know hopefully embarked on a new journey of business together you know so that is that that's basically it that's basically the concept yeah mm -hmm. could you add some some context um about like the, the the types of advisors you're getting on the people joining the community and then also the size of the fund. Well, I keep this fund as a extremely, you know, um, exclusive thing, primarily because I want to make sure that everyone is serious about this whole thing. They want to do business, they want to meet people. And then, you know, it's not just a, something we just come and like have fun. Well, there's going to be lots of fun, but, you know, I, I also got to make sure that people are all serious about this. And uh, our advisors are, you know, startup founders that have been very successful, uh, you know, or, you know, some of the advisors are really high profile and then, you know, they run, they're like pioneers in their own field, even though they're like 37 years old, something like that, you know, and then, um, a lot of our partners are people that have already had exits, you know, a lot of our partners are people that, you know, have been working this field for a long time, even though they're very young people and then they, 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 you know, have a lot of experiences and just in general and mo most importantly have new ideas they, they have vibrant that this vibrant we have this vibrant energy we're just like we just create like we have so many ideas that we want to touch on and then you know um so and then for our members you know these are all people that are passionate about their career you know we are 18 year olds 21 year olds like just young people. And then we, we, we have so many different ideas. We see the society in such a different way that a lot of other people do. Um, and you know, most importantly, we, we, we are, you know, we're allowed to take risks. We are allowed to, uh, chase our dream. And then we're allowed to, we're allowed to go anywhere we want. And then this is why we have this, this has society because I want this to be a powerhouse for people like me and you. And then I want this to be something that would keep supporting us to pursue, you know, our career in a future with, with, with passion. And then, you know, hopefully, um, we can keep supporting our members till, you know, till, till forever, you know, you know, I hope hopefully in the future, you know, when we are all successful in respective careers, we can, you know, reconnect through this fund and then, you know, um, you know, embark on a new journey together. So it's always exciting. You know, it's always exciting it's an exciting time we have exciting people and then it's a it's an exciting fun why do you think uh that this entrepreneurship community has become so close and that people want to help each other so much and you you've thoroughly touched on this about the importance of advisors how do you think that idea came to you about needing someone that's already gone through the journey to actually help you through through the process because people that because only only people that have gone through this understand the hardships and the excitement of this journey and then they are the only people that can help you and then you know um our advisors are all 
I have like a good way to say this is that all of our advisors are either are still in this journey, are are, are still discovering themselves. There, we're we're in, we're young people, and they they could have a couple million dollars or like a, a huge company in their in their hand, but you know they could get fired immediately. You know, like without knowing anything, like they're still trying to figure out what they're doing with their life, right? And then, you know, um, you know, no matter like we of first like of course they have business successes and then they have a lot of experience in business, but um. The, the, they're still trying to figure things out. And then the good thing about still trying to figure things out is that we are open to the, the greatest changes. And then, you know, which is the reason why we're, we, we, we're so supportive to each other because, you know, we, we, we have to share passion towards a similar goal. But in the meantime, we're also open to, to change. And then, you know, we're open to perspectives. We're open to a lot of things. We, we are a fluid, we're fluid people. And then, when we blend with each other, we, we sort of just, you know, learn from each other and try to extract the, the, the experiences and then, and then like the, the virtue from each other. And then, you know, and then, and then just, 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 just become better entrepreneurs or better business oriented people. You know, that's, I would say that's how, that's how everybody works. Mm -hmm. how, how have you used that skill, um, from entrepreneurship with Juventus Capital and Volton? And then blended that with your uh, knowledge on China and economic policy into your role working as an advisor uh, for a company I believe is called Uto. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you explain a bit a bit more about what Uto is, how you became an advisor for them, uh, what the goal is, and, and why your expertise is so important in, in working with someone like them or with them? So early on, when I was working as a research re research assistant, I, I have been extremely passionate about. Um, the idea of me understanding both American economic policy and Chinese like political elite politics um, that this concept of me being fluent at both languages you know really allows me to make a change and then later on when I was working with a lot of think tanks for a foundation or like just academic or for business organizations in general I realized that my, my special background in, 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 in East Asia really helped me because, you know, as you can see, if RV, I'm, I speak in English like you, I'm just like you, you know, I'm, I'm a kid. I listen to Kendrick Lamar, all that. I'm just a normal kid. From I have this other side where I understand China a lot and understand what's going on in this country, you know. So, you know, a lot of times I, it's easy for me to, to we to build a trusting relationship with an American investor or startup. In the meantime, I have a trusting relationship with a VCPE or with with um, a, a company that is established in China. You know, these are two totally different society with two with totally different rules. And then again, as I mentioned, there's a lot of misunderstandings, asymmetric information. You know, so but um, for me, I'm able to bond these people together. And then because I am the agent um, that they're they mutually trust um you know i can create a lot of business opportunities between the need unlimited business opportunities between a lot of companies in china and and us or, or other countries and then u2 is one of the largest uh plastic uh, no pa many uh, packaging manufacturing companies in the world and then they are very successful and then i had the privilege to know you know excuse me to know their founder and CEO through work. And then, um, and then, you know, one day we're talking about, oh, you know, they're like, hey, we want to, we want to invest in India. We want to, you know, establish our factories in India. And then, in fact, this company has factories all, all over the world, but, you know, my co-founder, Rithik, is extremely connected in India. And then similar to me, you know, he has, we have mutual trust and he, he has mutual, he has trust with like, real trust relationship with like some companies in India. So there's a lot of, so there's so what happened was I was like wait I can help you guys because I I just this guy I absolutely trust and then we were friends and then he's friends with a lot of in, big Indian you know politicians and you know like companies and then you know maybe we can all invest and then so um, we actually help them to connect a lot of people in India and then we're we we literally just sit there and translate for them and then we literally just we are the only people that are facilitating this and then 
it's a 20 million, like they wanted to invest $20 million around. And then like we, me and Rithik are the only people that are doing, doing this and we're just facilitating everything. But, um, the, the, I would argue that the interesting fact is without me and Rithik, Rithik, this thing would never happen because particularly because, you know, you don't find people that you trust that easily in India and in, in India. And then, you know, you don't find people that you trust that much in China as an Indian, you know, businessman. So like these, so me and Rithik allowed this bond to be very deep. And then, you know, because we all trust each other, we make deals happen. And I would also argue that in my cap, in my fund, uh, Juventus Capital, there are a lot of people like this. We have people that have backgrounds in different uh, regions of cultures, but, you know, we have, we're such a diverse, you know, society, but, you know, we all share the same level of trust with each other. And then with this, we can basically mobilize a lot of resources, you know, in different regions of the world and really just try to see if there's any chemistry between, between them. And then, you know, possibly, you know, just, 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 just create more business opportunities and economic opportunities, you know, in this ever globalizing economy. What would you say is next for you? You're very young. Uh, you're still under 20. Uh, you've got a lot of years ahead of you and you're already doing all of these things. Um, is the goal to continue down the entrepreneurship path, do more deals on a larger scale across the world, build up Juventus Capital, build up Molten and, and you know, subsequent ventures? Uh, would you ever think about going into politics or anything like that? What's the goal in the short, medium and long term? I have no idea. And that's the best part. I have no idea what I'm going to do after Juventus Capital. And I had no idea that I was going to do, that I was going to found Motum, um, you know, when I was working as a researcher and then when I was working on Motum, I had no idea that I'm going to do this cap. So, you know, for me, I just go with the flow. And then the good part is, the good thing is I have such a, such a great toolbox that allows me to solve a lot of problems. And then, you know, I can work on almost like a lot, like anything that I want to with my knowledge and then, you know, just, I just let my life take wherever I, I go. And then, you know, I, I'm always just relaxed, you know, well, I'm a little bit tense when I'm working, but you know, I'm always generally relaxed about my life. And then, you know, just, you know, see wherever, see where life takes me. And then that's the best part because when you're doing this, you, you're open to your greatest change. And then I have a high risk tolerance. I'm young, I'm 18. You know, I can mess up a little bit. You know, it's all right. Um, I'll get back up. And then I don't know what's, what's waiting for me, what's coming for me. And then I am extremely excited. You know, I, I do a lot of business stuff, so I'm still an 18-year-old kid. I'm extremely excited for my future, you know. So, Leon, what advice would you have for young entrepreneurs, uh, people in their, their teenage years, or even people that are older um, in other fields that would like to get into entrepreneurship? but don't currently have this toolbox that you describe and that being the skills of what it takes to create a business or conjure up an idea, how would you suggest they find these skills or develop them to get involved in this world, to do deals and get involved in the entrepreneurship and business world? I, I think, you know, um, if, if you know, like if you have, if you watch those like Marvel superhero movies, you know, it's, it's like the reason why a lot of people become superheroes is oftentimes because like one specific, you know, I get bit by like a spider, I become superhero. Like that embarks on an incredible journey that basically, you know, becomes the main theme of your life. And I think a lot of people wait for this thing to happen. You know, a lot of people, you know, young people or especially like, you know, older people to be like, you know, I'm not going to do business, you know, but maybe one day if there's good opportunity, if like someone invite me, if I bump and do this like great person, then it's like, I will do it, uh, you know. And for young kids, they're like, maybe I'll learn more, but I'll wait a little bit. Maybe, you know, one day I'll learn this. I, I would meet this great person that would teach me a lot about business. And I will get into business. I'm, I, you know, maybe one day I will found this really cool concept that I can work on. And then, uh, you know, it's all sorts of stuff. And then my idea is you don't have to wait. You don't really have to wait to be bitten by the spider. You know, you can just go. And then I think more like being being have the courage having the courage to go to go forward and embark on this journey is the most important thing you know you know i i would also argue that a lot of times 
when you want something bad enough, you'll be able to get it. And then when I was a scholar, I've never, when I was like in academia, I was, I never thought of doing business. You know, I got to talk to so many people, you know, you got to, a lot of people might trick you into doing stuff like that. But, you know, I, I just decided to do it. You know, it's literally just maybe one day you woke up and you say, like, okay, I'm going to try to see what can I, what can I do. I want to, I would jump into this water and then I will see what it takes me. Right. So I think, especially for young people, this, 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 um, this mindset is extremely important and you have to relax. You have to be open to change and all that. These are all important. And also, it is also important to be, to be patient because, you know, a lot of times you work a little bit, there's no, there's no result, you know, I don't want to work anymore. But the reality is I failed so many times before I this eventually establish a good business or establish a good foundation for my business. So, you know, you know, even now I'm making mistakes every day. I'm, but then every, but the most important part is that I don't give up every day. I correct my mistakes. And then it's, it's a hard journey to go, to go to, to go on. But, um, it's also fascinating because you get to meet so many great people. You get to change your life in such a exciting way. You know, I, I would argue that it's always worth it. Being a high school kid, and creating a startup, I think is commonly viewed as an anomaly. Um, but having seen people like Mark Zuckerberg and particularly Stanford University, I think there's a, a common misconception uh, that there's this huge startup culture on campuses and professors and every student is just frantically creating a startup. And it's this, you know, this thing that's seen everywhere. From my own experience, I would say that it's been a lot harder to find entrepreneurs on campus and that these people are more secluded and hidden off themselves. But what you're doing with Juventus Capital is obviously bringing these people together. What has your experience been of the startup culture at elite universities? And what's the day-to-day like being an actual startup founder at Duke? Well, it's actually, well, I think I have a very unique way to work. I, I really just, um, I'm a really explosive um, person in terms of working. And then I don't, I don't, I don't have a consistent, you know, I'm not, I'm not consistent. I would say I, I, when I have something like, I usually just sit down, relax and just chill. But when something goes up, I become really, um, intense and I, and I fix these issues pretty efficiently. And then I, but, um, as an, as a, as an entrepreneur on campus, you're always expecting to, you, you always want to meet new people. And then the most important thing is you have to think about, you know, like you have, you have to remind yourself that at any moment, you know, you might just meet a person to change your life that gives you a new direction that, you know, gives you a new idea, you know, that inspires you. And then that has happened multiple times throughout my, you know, short, what, three months of experience at Duke. Um, sure. it, it's fascinating. And, you know, you got to always constantly remind yourself to measure people, not by, you know, their size or appearance, but by their heart. You know, there's so many different people from so many different backgrounds, but, you know, some of these people are really, really impressive. And then they, you, you know, so on campus, you know, just, just, just always expect to meet good people. And then when you meet good people, take good care of them and then, you know, connect to them and, and you know, try to talk to them more and then, you know, be friends with them. You know, that's, that's, that will be my, my, my take. And, but in addition, also like you, you, you also, you have to, be, um, I would argue that like, just really don't care about, don't, don't, don't really care about the hiring. Like at Duke, especially like our college is like, there's undergrads are especially taken care of. And then we have so many resources, you know, don't be afraid to talk to people. You know, like there's just one day I was walking around the, the university admin building and then I, I met like the the provost or something like that and then i talked to her and then you know i didn't even know who she is i was just joking around i'm like oh are, are you a professor she said yes i said do you teach she said no i said okay do you do research she said no so oh, so you get paid for doing nothing on so stuff like that right so like <laughs> i just talked to them and then you know and i get the number you know i i, I talked to them and then they, they they these are very great people that virus them brings a lot of opportunity so just always be open to change and then always like, that's gonna be that's gonna be the podcast title. Leon Zhang says Jeep Cross does nothing. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. No, you can I mean, I was... <laughs> No, of course not, of course. Yeah. Um 
I've got uh, sort of two final questions. I mean, you've had this very unique perspective uh, in being immersed in a lot of different things and the people you've been able to meet. I've been quite curious as to your thoughts on the mind behind a VC firm. But particularly, I'd be interested in your thoughts on entrepreneurship in China and what it looks like in China. I mean, you were talking about that specific community and how your research um, was particularly prevalent in wanting to encourage more entrepreneurship. They didn't do that. And then they had a financial problem. Um, so yeah, just repeat that mind of VC firm and then also entrepreneurship in China, your thoughts on, on that. VC firm in China or a VC firm in general? Uh, either or. Okay. So um, actually a lot of our partners at the uh, fund are, you know, very distinguished individuals from VC. And then, you know, um, I would say a VC firm, you know, again, it's, 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 a, it's a very exciting culture. You know, it's, it's like you're meeting all these young people, you know, they, they, they start something and, you know, they might become the next big thing. You never know. So when it comes to VC firms, they're always looking for, though there's, of course, technical side, you know, are you going to be successful? Are you going to, what, what kind of demand you're responding to? But um, I think the person you are really matters. And then, you know, it's not always about, you know, the more matured I am, the more calculated I am, the better, like, the more appreciated I will be. You know, sometimes it's, it's a good mix of maturity and, 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 and it's a, the good mixture of maturity and childishness allows you to be able to, you know, work hard and in the meantime, take risk. It's, it's, it's a combination of courage, patience, and more importantly, your, um, your, your, your dedication to your, um, to your cause that, that really inspires, that, that really, that really gets you the attention from the VCs and, you know, but that would be my general answer. But I, again, I, I cannot speak for all VCs. And then I would say that every VC has their own little philosophy. And then to raise money, you got to talk to like hundreds of them. Like, like for me, I, I probably gave my pitch like probably 300 times, you know, open up. But um, yeah, I talk to every, you talk to people about it. You know, it's like in the back of my, in the back of my head right now, you know, I just, you know, I can just snap, like go through all my, other products and every single like pitch I've been through, like I, I know how to, I can just pitch you right now. You know, I don't even have to think at this point, but so that would be for the BCs. And in China, um, China is such a fascinating country, man. It's just, um, so many opportunities. And then the startup culture in China is definitely, uh, definitely has rooms of improvement, but I would also argue that China is a very unique society that has unique demands that a lot of people. It's, it's tricky to understand. It's, it's to the quest to understand China is elusive, and um, even for Chinese people themselves, even for me, you know. So like, um, we have a lot of good companies, um, but we, we have very good investment firms. But um, you know, I, I I say, you know, it's 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 it has room for improvement. But again, at anywhere in the world, you know. To have us to, 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 to build a good startup culture, you know, as a startup to, 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 you know, to, to, to be successful in this country, you need to abide to these, uh, principles or these philosophies that I would, I, I just mentioned, I would, I would, I would, I would say, and then, you know, if you stick to these principles, you will be successful anywhere. Do you have, um, anything else, uh, that you'd like to share with listeners? I mean, if there was one thing that a listener could take away from today about Leon Zhang and, and think about that could help their life or change the way they think about things going forward, what would that be? Hmm. I would say in the end, like if you wake up in the morning and you're happy, like you're successful. And then there's very many different ways to define success. And um, I am an entrepreneur. I, I do a lot, entrepreneur. I do a lot of things. I, I you know, like cool things, you know, working with YouTube and I tell people about it, like, oh, shoot, you know, it's crazy. But um, in the end, there are many different versions of success and then everyone has their own version of success. Like sometimes, you know, every Thursday, like in the Thursday, I would work for, in this like food truck with like two guys in like, a, in, like in like a small ass food truck for like six hours serving kosher Jewish food to the do community. I, I feel happy, you know, like so, you know, in the end, do what makes you happy. And then, you know, in the end, there's, I don't think there's a distinguished, there's, there's like 
a very fine line between work and leisure. I think there's just things that you don't want to do and things you want to do. And then always do things that you want to do and then just just always be happy. You know, if you're happy, you win. Right? Amazing. Uh, I'm very privileged to be able to, to listen and ask you lots of questions today. I'm sure I'm going to ask you a lot more going forward as I engage my own entrepreneurship journey. Um, I feel I feel like that there's so much that you've been able to touch on. And I feel like we could have even made probably 10 podcasts just going over each of the different things that you, you've you achieved in such a short period of time. I think what you've been able to do going from you know writing to a professor, actually working for him, and then mm-hmm. writing for newspapers, getting involved with the Ford Foundation, and then actually creating and getting immersed in business. I think there's one thing for saying, I'm going to do this, or I'm interested in China, or I'm actually want to do something. But what's so impressive about you is you've actually done it. You say these things, and then you've actually gone and achieved them. I mean, what you've done with Waltham and actually being able to raise huge mm-hmm. amounts of money and actually go and build a business, generate partnerships with the Washington, D.C. government, generate partnerships with the Mar- Marriott Hotel. And I'm sure there'll be a lot more uh, to learn about going forward as that as that enrolls. And mm-hmm. actually be able to see what you've done with Juventus Capital. And um, I'm hugely interested to see what happens with that moving forward. And I think both the quality of the advisors he got on, but most importantly, as I was mentioning with, the, in my opinion, the lack of entrepreneurship community, mm-hmm. actually building people like that at Duke and across college campuses is amazing. Um, and then also, obviously also your amazing work with UTO. Uh, I'm sure anyone that's listening to this podcast has a huge amount to take away from it. I think there are so many learnings uh, to take. And the fact that you're only 18 and have been able to generate all of these insights is incredible. Uh, so thank you so much for joining me today, um, Leon. Thank you for having me. You know, it's 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 my honor. And you know, I, I, this is just a story of me. You know, I'm 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 still just 18 year old kid. You know, I have so many different things that awaits. You know, new chapter awaits. So you know, I I'm happy to be on this podcast. I'm really honored. And then I hope I hope my story can, you know, help people understand, you know, how how to you know deal with specific like especially I wanted like teenagers. You know, I want to help teenagers and like kids to understand. You know, how to you know, transition themselves to, you know, be a business person or like to, to do whatever, right? So like, if I can help, uh, it will be my greatest honor. Mm-hmm. Thank you for having